There is nothing I love more than your prison. I love to feel your Holy Spirit flood over my soul. And the joy that you bring makes my heart sing your praise. And my love for you, Holy Ghost, it lasts forevermore. I've come to worship you. I've come to pray.
Cast me not away, but take not your Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51, Lord. come on and bless him. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Amen. The Bible said in Matthew 18, verses 19, if two agree on earth, as touching any one thing that they should ask, it shall be given to them by their Father, which is in heaven. Somebody say, it shall be given. Hallelujah. By our Father, which is in heaven. Now, I got a holy boldness, but also got a holy nosiness. You be seated if you like. James 4 and 2 said, you have not because you ask not. One day I was reading that scripture, and it began to read me. Amen. And a uh, question arose up in my spirit, and I said, Now, Lord, you said to agree on earth is touching any one thing that we should ask, it shall be given to us by our Father, which is in heaven. And you said in Matthew 6 and 8 that you are our Father, and you know what we have need of before we ask. So I said, Lord, before I ask, I think I need to ask you what I need to ask for. <laughs> well, seeing that you already know what I have need of, hallelujah. And in Matthew 6 and 8, he said, your father knows what you have need of. So I immediately said, said my father knows that I need him. I ask for you. I ask for you, Holy Ghost. Then Luke 11, 13 hit my spirit. Jesus said, if you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more should you have a father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I said, God, I'm not asking for power at this moment. I'm not asking for a thing. I'm not asking for something. I'm asking for someone. I need you, Holy Ghost. Psalms 80, verse 18 says, So that we'll not turn back from you again quicken or anoint us to call upon your name. So I said, Holy Ghost, without you, I can't even call on his name like I ought to. Amen. First Corinthians 12 and 3, the Bible said in the word of the Lord, and I love this scripture, it says... Uh, by the Holy Ghost, we call him Lord. We can't know him as Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I said, Holy Spirit, without you, I'm just saying words. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm just spitting out words without you. Amen. Because Zechariah 12 and 10, God said through Zechariah the prophet, he said, the spirit of supplication. Say that with me. The spirit of supplication. The word S, or the letter S there in spirit is capitalized, meaning Holy Ghost. He's the spirit of prayer. He's the, he's the one, amen, that causes us to be able to pray sufficiently and by faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 said he is the spirit of faith. So there is no prayer of faith without the spirit of faith, the Holy Ghost himself. Amen. So I said, Holy Ghost, before I start asking for things, I ask for you. I, you're my greatest need. I need you. Hallelujah. I welcome you. What should I ask for? And I said, Lord, Matthew 18, 19, it says if two on earth, two or three on earth, amen, agree is touching any one thing that they should ask, it'll be given to them. I said, Father, you said if they just touch and agree on one thing. And then when I said one thing, I thought about Psalms 27, verses 4, where David said in the word of the Lord, he said, one thing I've desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I might dwell in his house all the days of my life, behold of his beauty, and inquire of him in his temple. Though he mentioned three things, he really was just talking about one thing. In other words, he said, you're the one thing. I need you. I need your presence. I need to know you. Hallelujah. Because if you'll back up to Psalms 27, I just go to verse 4, but verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Amen. To whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. To whom shall I be afraid of? Then in verses 3, he said, In this be confident. Somebody say in this. Be confident. And, and confident in this. What's this? This, that the Lord is my my life, the strength of my life, that he is my life and my salvation. Praise God. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great mighty things you know not of. A lot of times we focus on the great mighty things that we know not of. But the greatest answer of Jeremiah 33 and 3 is I. Capital I. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee. I. Somebody say I is the answer. Hallelujah. The I am is the answer. So Jeremiah was saying when God said to call unto me, he said, I'll be the answer. I'm the answer. That's what prayer is about. It ain't about getting just things from me. Amen. It's about getting to know me. It's about knowing me. It's about getting me. Praise God. One day I was praying and I said, Lord, I ask for you. Praise God. I'm praying for you. And somebody would think, well, does God need prayer? How do you, in this sense, he does. He needs me to pray. Amen. Before he can move in my life. Praise God. Amen. And I began to pray. I said, Lord, I pray for you. 
In other words, it's you I want in my prayer. Lord, you can do a miracle for me and I still not know you. I need to know you, the miracle worker. I want you. Hallelujah. So in Matthew 18, verses 19, when he said, well, there are two or three on earth, amen, touch one thing and agree. He said, at the beginning of them. So I began to ask, I said, Lord, what's the one thing? And then I just took you on that journey through Scripture. Well, the one thing I need is him. My greatest need is him. Before I start asking him for things, I need to ask him for him. Holy Ghost, you're the greatest reward of my time in prayer. If ye then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, and much more, shall your heavenly Father. Here it is, give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. Amen. Luke 11, verse 13. So somebody shout, we need the Holy Ghost. He's our greatest need. He's the greatest reward. Amen. When we pray. It's not fans. It's him. And I promise you, every time you pray, you can have him. You might not get your healing every time you pray. You might not get your breakthrough every time you pray. But you will if you'll keep praying. Come on, somebody. And persist. But I promise you, just as sure as salvation, if you call on him, amen, from the depths of your heart, longing for him, he will show up. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, he'll come every time if you'll call on him. And in Matthew 18, 19, when he said that one thing that they would agree on, just two or three, get together. Don't take a crowd. Come on, somebody. Amen. Just get, get a couple of folks together. Amen. Then call on my name and touch this one thing to be given to them by my Father, which is in heaven. Well, Luke 11 and 13, Jesus said the Father wants to give you the Holy Spirit if you'll ask him. Come on, somebody. In Acts chapter 2, amen, the Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in the same place and one accord. That's Acts 2 verses 1. In just four days, we'll celebrate Pentecost Sunday, amen, 50 days since Jesus was raised from the dead. That's what pity means. But in Acts 1, 14, the Bible said they continued in prayer with the women, amen, and the men. They all prayed together. They started out with probably 300 plus, amen, but 10 days of prayer kind of, amen, causes some to stay and some to leave, amen, somebody. It kind of weeps through those that's just there, amen, and those that's there for a reason. And about 120 was left in that upper room on that 10th day when the Holy Ghost showed up in that room, praise God, but tongues of fire appeared unto them. Amen. Glory to God. And God began to do manifestations by His Spirit and 3,000 souls were saved in just one day. And signs and miracles hit the church and they should be still in the church because the Holy Ghost ain't coming. He's already here. Come on somebody. Somebody shout Pentecost continues. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. But the Bible said they were praying. What were they praying for? They weren't there just praying for power. They were praying, glory to God, for the person of the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon them because Jesus told them in Luke 24, verse 49, he said, Go tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued or clothed with power from upon high. In other words, go spend time in that upper room, amen, and pray until my Father sends the Holy Ghost. So we see in the book of Acts, before Pentecost came, they were all in one place in one accord. Somebody shout, they were in one place in the same mindset. It ain't hard to get folks in one place. Every time people gather in the church, they in one place. They in one place or another, but they all in one place. Those that's planning to go to the place wherever they are, they're there together, but that don't necessarily mean they're all there in one accord. They're not there for the same reason. When we see the book of Acts taking place, and by the way, this is the only church Jesus ever started. Amen. Somebody shout a tongue talking. Amen. A uh, devil evicting, body healing, dead raising. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Again, sin preaching church. I mean, that's that, that's kind of, that's all the church he ever started. Hallelujah. Pentecostal or Pentecost is not a denominationalism. It never has been. It's the church Jesus began. That's where he poured out his spirit. That day, that's when the church was born. And she began to do miracles, signs, and wonders. And the world, uh, amen, said, my God, they act just like Jesus. Somebody shout, that's all the church he ever started. Hallelujah. Praise God. So it's not a denomination. Amen. But, but, but listen here. What, what I want us to see, amen, is they were there together in one place, but they were also in one accord. The one accord, the one mindset that they were in was that in prayer. They weren't praying for this. They weren't praying for that. They were praying for this is that. Come on. Acts 2, 16, after the Holy Ghost was poured out, Peter stood up and he began to preach. And he said, this is that which was prophesied unto you by the prophet Joel. Verse 17, that it shall come to pass in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he began to connect what Joel prophesied in Joel 2, amen, to what Pentecost, amen, that day. Glory to God in that upper room when the Holy Ghost was poured out. But here's what I want you to see was taking place. They were in one place. They were in one accord. They had one word from Jesus. Go tarry and pray because I'm going to send my Holy Ghost. They weren't there for 10 days praying God heal my knee bone. God fix my earlobe. God fix this that's 
going on in my house. God do this or do that. No, they were there not for this or for that. They were there for this is that. They were there for one purpose, one reason, for the Holy Ghost. Would to God if church folk could ever come together just for the Holy Ghost again. Wonder what would happen if we just gather for him again. Holy God, I ain't leaving till you manifest. Holy Ghost, I ain't going nowhere until you show up and show out. Somebody shout, I'm glad you're here, but I didn't come to see you. I come for the Holy Ghost. I come to have a move of him. That's the only reason they came together and prayed. You know what? When they came together in one place and got in one accord for one reason, that was that the Holy Ghost might manifest and show up. Amen. They didn't have to pray for miracles. They didn't have to pray God help me preach. They didn't have to pray God please save the soul. The early church prayed one prayer. Holy Ghost came. I want you. Every worship, every sound of praise, every theme of prayer that was made by the early church was Holy Ghost come. Glory to God. I got to have you. Because when he comes, my God, preacher, you'll preach. When he comes, singer, you'll sing. When he comes, you'll pray like you ain't never prayed before. When he comes, people will get saved. When he comes, miracles will take place. When he comes, demons will come out. God said in his word through Jesus, in Matthew 12 and 28, he, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God is coming now unto you. Jesus said, this is the kingdom of God. If the Spirit of God, amen, overpowers devils and evicts them. Come on, somebody shout, that is the kingdom of God. Someone asked me what time's a preacher. What is the kingdom of God? I said it's the Holy Ghost having full reign and supremacy with among his believers. And they want him and they will let him loose and let him do what he wants. That's when God's kingdom comes and the devil's runs. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody shout, that's the kingdom of God. Let the Holy Ghost move. Today, modern Christianity is accustomed to having church, doing church. Hello? Even apart from Holy Ghost. And they're caught up doing church, but they fail, amen, to exhibit the kingdom. Somebody say the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 4.20, the Bible said, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Somebody shout, the kingdom of God is in power. It ain't even just preaching a word. It ain't just having a good Sunday service. Come on, somebody. It ain't just showing up, uh, hearing a good song, and shaking the preacher's hand. We're going to say, ooh, that was a good sermon. How ain't you sick of good sermons? Come on, somebody. Ain't you tired of good old services? Uh, come on, somebody. What you just said was, uh, we've had it before, and it was good again. That's really all you said. We've heard it before, and it was good like it was the last time. Oh, it's good again. Hallelujah. Glory, just like after you, you ate your favorite meal. You ate it the first time you ate it. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. It's just the same old, same old. But the kingdom of God, when God speaks of his kingdom, he ain't talking about just having church and doing church. Amen. And just church on Sunday and church out. Amen. Come back the next week. No, he, when he says kingdom, he's saying the spirit of God is moving because Jesus said here's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes nigh you when the Holy Ghost is moving. When the Holy Ghost and his gifts are permitted and allowed. Come on church. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? If his gifts ain't allowed in the church, that's all it is. It's, it's a church. Hallelujah. It can't produce kingdom results. Somebody shout your kingdom come. Well, if you want his kingdom to come, you got to let the Holy Ghost take over. You got to let the Spirit of God have full reign in a rule. Anybody hear him? Hallelujah. Somebody shout your kingdom come. You say that, you're saying Holy Ghost come. So back in Matthew 18 verse 19, the one thing that they were touching and agreeing on is found in the very next verse, verse 20. He said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be. There's that I. I will be in the midst of them. Now don't get me wrong. You can take Matthew 18 and 19 and say two or three of us can agree on earth, touch any one thing. We can agree on things. And I, that's not, I, I've used that scripture for different multiple different things to ask for when praying with people or even having somebody pray for me. Amen. So I'm not saying you can't use it that way, but really in the context of what it is concentrating on is his countenance. It's his presence. Amen. The purpose of the prayer is the one thing they're asking and agreeing for is uh, that you be in the midst. They're touching and agreeing on this one thing. Somebody say one thing. Those two or three where they're gathered that he would be in the midst. 
Praise God. And is that not a portrait, amen, of Acts 1? The church early praying in one place, chapter 2, verses 1, but in one accord. The whole reason they had gathered together and the only prayer they was praying was, Holy Ghost, we're waiting on you. We ain't going to do a thing until you come. Glory. Wonder what happened if folks would get together on church on Sunday morning and pray until he really just shows up and then start singing. And then, then, come on, start doing whatever it is that they normally do. But you know what modern Christianity does? It's got a custom to do in church and has forgot about the kingdom. Glory to God. They walk up. The first thing they start doing is announcing announcements. They start telling everybody what's coming up. Amen. What we're going to be doing. Amen. And we've replaced the move of God with church activities. We, we, we got the mind, not of the spirit, but the sense of the meeting. Come on, church. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Somebody shout, we need to forsake all this stuff. Amen. And we need to turn back to like the early church did. They got together in church for one reason. Amen. Holy Ghost come. Somebody say it with me. Holy Ghost come. Glory to God. You know in Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 8. Jeremiah the lamenting prophet. The weeping. Amen. Man of God. Delivering God's word with tears running down his face. God sending to his own people those that had went astray from him. And, and he said to the people of God in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 8, he said, The priests say not, Where is the Lord? Well, one of his things he accused the people of God of in that day, and he started at the pulpits. He said, Priest, somebody say, Preacher, you no longer say, Where is the Lord? Wow. Where is the Lord? You know, I could have pulled up here and said, where is the people? But I refuse to concentrate on where is the people. I just I just want to concentrate on where is the Lord. Hallelujah. A lot of, a lot of ministries are so focused on where are the people. Hallelujah. But if you got people without the Lord, all you got is a good country club. Come on, somebody. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? What makes it a church is the Holy Ghost there. And again, like we've been quoting in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, he don't need but two or three, amen, to do that. Come on, church. Amen. So some folks are so caught up on crowds. And, 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 and I know some that wouldn't even have church tonight if they didn't have at least 25 folks in the room. They'd cancel. Praise God. But where is the Lord? Somebody say, where is the Lord? In John chapter 20. Amen. When Mary come up to the empty tomb where Christ had been raised from the dead on that early morning, when she got there and couldn't find his body, she looked in and she began to weep in verse 14 and she couldn't even see nothing. And when she did see Jesus, she was looking through a blurred vision. Amen. And sometimes that's what sorrow will do in a blurry vision. Come on, somebody, who he is. And she tried to see him and she don't even know who it is. She said, Sir, for supposing he was a gardener. Amen. Of the gardener. Well, where have you taken my Lord? Where have you laid, laid him? Let me know and I'll go get him. Praise God. And finally, he called her name about twice. Hallelujah. And when he did, her eyes were cleared and opened and she saw who he is and she called out Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And she fell down at his feet. Ain't that amazing? She got to the empty tomb. Somebody say angels were still there. Now, don't you know if you'd have showed up at a tomb, uh, if you couldn't have got to Jesus, an angel would have been pretty good. Come on. Amen. She's looking at an angel. Angels are talking with her. Somebody shout, she's being touched by an angel. She's having an experience with an angel, but that don't interest her. Where is he at? Mm.